You are listening to the REI Mastermind Podcast. Join JD as he chats with industry-leading real estate experts and professionals. We learn from their experience and uncover the strategies to their success that we can implement into our own businesses and we can drive immediate results today. They share their experience and wisdom as we build the foundation to our own success. This is the REI Mastermind Network. We have Drew White on the call here today. Drew, I really appreciate your time. And uh, we are going to unravel the box of this term called infinite banking to a certain extent because uh, I think everybody's heard it, but I think uh, there's some miscommunications and, and some misunderstandings of what that actually is and how sure. it can be used. But Drew, I really appreciate your time. But before we do, I really want to make sure everybody has uh, your website address. So it's ibcdrew.com, D-R-E-W.com. I'll make sure to include those links in the show notes. Um, but um, Drew, I really appreciate your time. And it's going to be interesting because you have quite the story. I mean, you started off being a nurse and now you yep. are in real estate investing and infinite banking. Uh, let's start things off. How did you go from point A to point B? <laughs> it was a long winding road, but um, first, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, I listened to actually quite a few episodes now and really got a lot of value from it. And uh, hopefully I can add some today. But um, yeah, so I, I graduated from, a nur- uh, from nursing school uh, about 12 years ago and graduated with $150,000 of, uh, well, a little bit more than that, student loan debt. Um, started become, you know, start working as a nurse and realized I was going to make about $35,000 a year at the start. And, uh, you know, that math, uh, didn't really add up for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. Um, and so, you know, I used to tell this as like my sob story, right. Of like, oh, I used to, I was $150,000 in debt and I made this terrible life decision at age 19. Um, but you know, over time, I'm actually grateful, um, for that situation, uh, because, it really led me to where I am today. And, uh, and so for me, it's like that debt is what kind of kickstarted my financial, um, I guess you'd say fire a little bit. And so, you know, I, I think I, I became a Dave Ramsey guy <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, I'm no longer, you know, as big of a fan. Um, but that, that is really how I started to kind of start questioning things. And, and I, and that led me a little bit to a scarcity mindset, to be honest, of once I got us out of that debt, it was like, um, okay, what do I do now? I have no assets. I have, I just, I'm at zero, you know, where do I go from here? And so that's where it really led me to start researching like, well, what do other wealthy people do? Um, how do I get kind of, I, I recognized that I was kind of becoming a, a penny pincher. Um, I mean, I even couponed at one point. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. so I kind of was like, you know, what are the wealthy people doing? And that led me down to um, real estate. Uh, which led me to, if you want to get into it at some point here, uh, flipping mobile homes for a few years. And then during that time, uh, also discovering this infinite banking concept and becoming your own banker. And again, you know, what are the wealthy doing? It's, it's really, um, you know, copying banks, which is one of the best businesses in the world. Um, and so that's kind of, that's, that's a you know brief overview of how I got to, to here. And I, and I just, you know, actually last month, let my uh, nursing license lapse. So officially, uh, no longer a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so, you know, I, you're not the only one who mentions Dave Ramsey and, and the, in his strategies and, and there's some practical good points he makes. Sure, I really yeah. like his snowball yeah. effect on how to, how to get, get rid of some debt. Um, yeah. But uh, so where are you now? I mean, you're let's, you, you said you had $150,000 in student loan mm-hmm. debt. It's mm-hmm. been what, seven years now that you've been doing this or has it been more than that? The um, infinite banking, you mean, or the, yeah, the real estate and the, yeah. the different um, real estate have probably been about three years. Um, you know, we've been out of debt for a while. We did, we did Dave Ramsey calls it a gazelle. Um, and so we did the gazelle style and got out of debt pretty quick and we were pretty intense about it, worked extra hours and things like that. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I looked into, flipping mobile homes and start and found a coach to, uh, teach me that. Um, and then, like I said, while I was doing that, I was like, I learned like, oh, this infinite banking stuff can go, you know, kind of hand in hand with that. And, uh, and then as I was flipping mobile homes, you know, 
realized maybe I was thinking a little too small. I mean, it's a good, it's a good niche, I'll be honest. And there's, you make some good returns. Um, but for me, it kind of created more of a job than what I was looking for. And I wasn't sure if mobile homes were the long-term uh, mm-hmm. thing I wanted to do, you know, in real estate. And so really started looking more at um, mobile home parks have been connected with a few people that um, they started buying them. And we're, you know, currently in discussions about, you know, me kind of coming on and maybe investing with them. Um, they've got a few deals that we've been discussing, me and two other guys. And so um, finally, I kind of just recently started making that transition to looking more maybe commercial um, and and doing that there. Does that kind of sure. answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, yeah. So in a relatively small amount of time, I mean, you've pretty much eradicated your debt. Um, I, th- what I think we're, let's spend a little time on the mobile home park or the mobile home sure. flipping, um, mm-hmm. you know, cause a lot of people, when they get into real estate investing, especially the first time that low hanging yeah. fruit for most people is getting into wholesaling the, the concept of yeah. getting a property under contract, no money down, mm-hmm. you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. But I, I always found that um, there's been a lot of success, especially starting off with with this lower income housing. I mean, mobile yeah. homes uh, usually don't take nearly as much money and resources as a a single family home, if you will. Correct. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, you're you're right. And so for me too, and some of that mindset that I was coming out of when I mentioned the scarcity and. Um, so I was coming out of this, oh man, I've been in debt and I wanted to get into real estate. And I was like, I wasn't ready to take on, you know, maybe single family and do a mortgage yet. Um, mm. And some of that, you know, it required a mindset shift for me a little bit in understanding that there's some good debt and bad debt. So at that time, I, you know, just randomly found mobile homes and saw, yeah, you can have a low cost of entry to get into it. And for me, I had always, and had told my wife this as well, it was really just like, hey, I want to do this to get my feet wet and just kind of learn, um, you know, on the ground, like boots on the ground about investing. And I figured um, what I had read about it was like, you can make a lot of mistakes and still turn out okay. And really, a lot of times your worst case scenario is you break even, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, and, and, you know, if you want to get in the details, really what what I was doing is, um, you know, providing financing for the homes and doing like a rent to rent to own option. And so you can, you can really, if you, you can find mobile homes for pretty cheap. You know, I, my first few were like $500 or less. Um, and, uh, I mean, do you want me to go into, I can go into the strategy a little bit if you'd like. Yeah. 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 If, if you have the time to do that, sure. Yeah. So, you know, the real strategy there is, um, you gotta be patient, you know, you don't, cause there are people who will give you their home, but you don't want it. <laughs> There's certain right. ones you don't want. Um, and I kind of learned that on my first one, but so the strategy is a little bit that you're looking for homes that, um, you know, maybe need some, a little bit of work, but not, not, everything. And then there's quite a few mobile home people that are handy, but maybe just can't get the fine. You can't really get financing for mobile homes. And so you can, you can, you know, tell them, Hey, you can finish this is like a, you know, um, kind of a handyman special and, you know, do a down payment and then we'll do monthly payments for, you know, five years, seven years. And, uh, and, and a lot of times on the down payment, the goal is to get your money back and maybe sometimes then some, so you're already starting from either zero or positive. Um, and so I had very few deals where I wasn't starting at just zero and then their monthly payment now put me in the positive. And so um, that's a little bit of the strategy there. You can also just, I mean, like you talked about wholesalers, you can you can flip them pretty quick too if you find ones and you just do cash deals if you, if you want to kind of just get started. Um, so it is, to me, it's a great way to get into it and just get started and you're going to learn a ton of lessons. My first, <laughs> my first one, I had two pages of notes of all the lessons I learned. So um, it's definitely uh, an interesting niche. That's really interesting. So tell me about you making that list of lessons learned. So after you after you did this a few times or your first one, you mm-hmm. actually stopped, took a breath, and actually made a list of of the lessons that you learned from the. Yeah. Um, so I am. Uh, I I use. I have it right next to me. Actually, Michael Hyatt's full focus planner. Um, I don't work for Michael Hyatt or anything, but um, he, in each week he has what's called an after action review. And so you kind of review the lessons that you learned the week before and things you want to stop, you know, keep, improve. And so I just took that same concept and applied it to the home. And I said, what are the things I did well, didn't do well, and what can I improve on? And obviously the improvements were far more. And so, yeah, so I just, I just sat there and did a real 
um, which I believe that comes from the military. They do after action reviews in the military. And so I just did a full on after action review on that home. And uh, unfortunately, the things I did wrong were far longer than the things I did well on that home. But again, I still came out and uh, you can make mistakes, still came out, out ahead on that one. Um, but I, I felt like I got lucky a little bit. And so that's why I thought, you know, I don't really want to get lucky again. I want to be more strategic. And so that's why I was really like, I'm going to write, make a list and learn from it. So you're, you're holding these notes on these mobile homes. Is that mm-hmm. where you, you started, your mind started to move towards this concept of being your own bank? You know, I, I, it was just random, um, but it did help me honestly, because when I first sat down with people talking about this, um, I explained what I was doing and they're like, oh yeah, you kind of get a little bit of how um, to be a banker, <laughs> yeah, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of one of the things I actually did say um, to some of the tenants. I had to explain like, you know, when you buy this home, I want to be real clear up front. Like I'm not the landlord. So if, you know, the AC goes out, you know, you don't call me because you wouldn't call the bank, you know, when you're financing your home about your AC going out. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, it did help. It wasn't actually how I got into it, but that did help me transition to kind of like start thinking like a bank a little bit. Yes. Um, Sure. So, so in the end, let's, let's define what infinite banking actually is. Yeah. So there, so, you know, it's the infinite banking concept or becoming your own banker. Um, Nelson Nash created it. Um, You know, actually he just, (laughs) he found it in a desperate situation and and came up with the, the idea. And a lot of people, there's, there's two different things I'd say is, Um, there's the vehicle that infinite banking uses. And some people like to think that that is itself infinite banking. Um, Infinite banking really is more about like taking control that believing that everybody should kind of take control of the banking function in their lives. And, you know, I don't know um, how you got started in real estate, but most people, you know, say, find a mentor, find Mm -hmm. someone successful doing what you want to do. Um, it's the same concept with banks. And so with banks, you know, they're one of the best businesses in the world. They're one of the best at leverage at uh, liquidity. And so really infinite banking come down to, you know, copying what they're doing and um, do and, and using that in your own life and your own finances as well. Sure. So can you give us an example? You mentioned the, uh, the product or, or what have you to, to pull this off. Like what, what are you referring to there? Yeah. Um, so I'm talking about, you know, it's, it's what we use. The vehicle that we use is specifically designed whole life insurance. And when I say copy what the banks are doing, um, if you look up Boli, B-O-L-I, uh, bank owned life insurance. So banks are uh, doing the same, the same thing. They actually max it out um, as much as they can um, to the extent that they're allowed to. And, uh, and so we, so we use um, whole life insurance like I said, specifically des- designed where we, you know, overfund it um, and, you know, your cash value can grow guaranteed tax-free once it's in there. Um, you know, we don't focus so much on the insurance, but you do get a death benefit, obviously. Um, and then the, I would say the beauty of it is you can put that money to work in your real estate. And while it's in your real estate or your business venture, you know, whatever you're doing, um, that you're actually using the insurance company's money. And so your money continues growing uninterrupted compounding, which most real estate investors uh, love compounded interest, right? So that's mm-hmm. kind of the, what I mean there. Sure. So um, so you get this whole life insurance policy. Can you walk us through the the process and how this works? You, you start to fund the whole life insurance and then you can borrow it to yourself or how does that work? Yep. Um, so you have to be, it has to be set up like, you know, specifically with a mutual company, because um, as a, uh, with a mutual company, you are considered a shareholder. And so um, you have certain rights that are, you know, you are given. And one of those rights is to take loans against the cash value that you have built up inside of your system. And so when you take that loan, you know, you're using the insurance company's money while your money is continuing to grow at that tax-free guaranteed Uh, Right. And the only a lot of questions, you know, that and you might ask this as a follow up is, you know, what are the terms of the loan and et cetera? Um, It's a simple interest only loan, 5% simple interest. Um, So, you know, $100 million, you're going to pay $5 million at the end of the year. 
most real estate people would be like, hey, give me $100 million, right? And I'll go make a lot more money with that. And I'll gladly pay someone $5 million to, to have use of that money. Mm-hmm. So uh, how do, so you said there's got to be uh, somebody in between there, right? Like this isn't ac- accessible, like just simply with a checkbook. Oh, like how to access the, the policy loan? Yeah. Yeah. So it really, you know, um, depends on who you work with. If you worked with, you know, my company, uh, we have a point person and you say, you know, hey, I want to take a loan. You know, for me, like I can give you just an example. Um, just like a, a month ago, uh, I took a loan and I called up our point person. I could also just call the insurance company. And, you know, I said, I need this money. And then they ask you how fast and where, um, which again is far different from a bank, right? You have your money in there, which they technically control. And you go in to use your money and they want to know, you know, your dog's vaccination records and all the things about you, right? Um, here, the insurance company doesn't actually care what you do with the money. Um, you know, for, and from their mindset, it's, it, you have access to it. It's, you're, allowed to, you're allowed it. So they just say, where do you want it? How quickly? Um, I received mine in less than 24 hours because I wanted it fast for a, a deal. And, um, and so you can, so you, you do call them up correct, um, but you have, you know, complete control over how, you know, well, I shouldn't say complete, but a lot of control over how quickly you can get it. Usually it's one to three to business days, but we've seen even quicker. So we say it's highly liquid for that reason. So when you do take that loan, is there like a term like a, or, or a link that you can have it out? Um, so good question. It's, it's really, the only term is it's, you're going to owe 5%, you know, total on it at the end of the year. Um, if you don't pay it back, you know, say, next year, you still owe 5% on that. Um, it's calculated daily. So, you know, um, I mean, just simple math. It's $100 at the end of the year, you owe $5. You take a $100 loan, you owe $5 at the end of the year. But let's say you pay 50 today. Well, then they now recalculate you owe 5% on the, the $50. Um, but this is where the infinite banking concept really comes in because this is where we talk about like thinking like a bank, acting like a bank. So, you know, we're talking a lot about the, you know, the vehicle um, but a lot of what we want to do is recapture that interest that we're letting kind of leak out to other systems, to the banks. Um, and so we talk about playing, and Nelson Nash talks about this in his book, playing honest banker with yourself. So you do want to set up, you know, terms that you uh, for yourself and recapture that inside your policy and repay that loan if you want to be an honest banker with yourself, um, which is what, you know, what I do and what others in our group group do and highly recommend. But, you know, if you need the year for a deal and you know, you, you, at the end of the year, you just need to pay back that 5% interest. So earlier you mentioned uh, that you can essentially borrow the cash value of the policy. When you say that, mm-hmm. is that the amount of money that you've actually put into the account? Yeah, correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So you can borrow up to like pretty close to like a hundred percent of that value um, that you've, that you've started to, you know, put into that system. Correct. And some people, you know, one thing they may get lost on, and I've had a few clients do this where they're like, I have a million dollar death benefit, so I can take a loan on a million dollars. And that's not, that's, uh, that is incorrect. (laughs) So I'll set that straight here. It has to do with, you know, we call it your deposits, but, you know, the insurance company calls it a premium. And so we talk, so for us, it's putting a deposit into your banking system. And th- this is kind of a low level question too, but when you're paying mm-hmm. that interest, you're paying that interest back to yourself within your, in your account, right? Your account yep. is yeah, essentially correct. growing with that interest you're paying. Yep. Correct. Yep. And, uh, and so, you know, and I'm not a CPA, I can't give, you know, tax advice, but um, you know, so there's, there's obvious benefits to that. You know, you're set, you're basically setting up a loan between yourself and hopefully if you're doing real estate, you've got an LLC or some kind of entity, um, and so, you know, for me and others I work with, they're able to deduct that, those taxes, um, or, not, or I guess deduct the interest that they're paying back on that loan. So there's some benefits there that you're getting, you know, outside the system and then inside the system, you're still going to get that tax-free, you know, guaranteed rate of return as well, which, um, you know, at first sometimes 4% tax-free guaranteed maybe doesn't sound amazing, but when you see it compound over time and each year, it's very different from the stock market where, you might be up 10%, the next day you're down 11%, but each year you lock in that 4% tax-free guaranteed and um, the insurance company, they can't go back on that number at that point. So, mm-hmm. so um, you know, th- this is very, you, your, your primary competition when it comes to this is obviously the self-directed IRAs. 
-hmm. there's a lot of gotchas with self-directed IRAs and and we mm -hmm. won't go into that here right now. Uh, in fact, there's previous sure. interviews uh, that I've done. <laughs> yeah. What are the gotchas here? Like what are some of the restrictions yeah. that are associated with what we're talking about here today? Yeah. So I get that question a lot of like, you know, sounds too good to be true. Um, so I would say, you know, the main, the main downside and issue is if someone is a short-term thinker, um, you know, and most real estate people aren't this way, but the main issue and um, thing that we come across is there's a first year cash drag. And it's really um, basically people used to be able to use whole life contracts, put in a dollar, get a dollar immediately. Um, I don't remember the exact date. I think it was early eighties. Don't quote me. Um, there became kind of a shift to focus more on putting money in 401ks and IRAs. And so um, as part of that whole life became made, was made by some laws a little less appealing. So the the main drawback is that first year, you know, you can get about 60 to 65% of your cash value if structured correctly. If you're going to go to just like an average Joe whole life insurance guy who doesn't know about infinite banking, um, to be honest, it's kind of a crap product that they'll give you. You're, you're going to get almost no cash value. So you need someone to design it with the right company to design it properly. But you can get about 60 to 65% initially. Um, and then we call that a cash drag, or we also call it, you know, you're starting your banking business, right? So most businesses maybe aren't profitable day one um, right away. And so for us, you know, you have to take that first year hit. But then what happens is if you can look long term, um, and like I said, most real estate investors can do this, um, you're going to see that compound interest that I mentioned. It's like, you know, let's just do a hypothetical. You put in, you know, $100,000. And I'm not saying that's what people have to do. I'm just giving you a big number. Um, you know, maybe year six, year seven, you put in $100,000, you've locked in the gains. You're now able to turn around and loan yourself $110,000. And so you do have to take that first year hit um, to get to that point. But what we say is there's no bank in the world that really rewards you for your loyalty. Uh, when you do your own banking and become your own banker, you get rewarded for that, that loyalty basically mm -hmm. over time. So, you know, you, you mentioned that the average Joe who's, who's doing whole life insurance policies, mo most of them may not even know what, what this is. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody is interested in talking to an insurance provider regarding this, what type of questions should they ask to make sure it's a good fit? Yeah. Um, so, the, you know, you want to know, can you take loans on it immediately? Um, you know, you want to also see the numbers and see that they're not just designing a traditional policy for you where you have no cash value. Um, you want to know if, if they have limits on how many loans you can take, like the companies that we work with and that we help people set up. Um, there's no limit on those. You know, you can take as many loans as you want. And, and also, does taking loans affect the growth of your policy? Does it um, mess up it in any way? Are there any restrictions, any kind of hidden rules? And each person that provides you with those numbers should be giving you like an illustration that you should really thoroughly read through. Um, I don't want to get too into the weeds, but also you want to make sure there's certain, you know, percentages that need, it needs to be designed properly. And there's some people out there who are kind of setting policies up maybe that are going to hurt the person long-term tax wise, because there is each contract has a tax number and it's specific to each person and how the, how it's designed that they can't, if they cross this number, this now becomes a taxable vehicle. And so you want to make sure that that person even knows that and that they've looked at it um, and that, you know, they're making sure that they're giving you enough room to put in this system so that you're not going to cross that. And that if, if you were going to cross it, that they would at least let you like us and the companies we work with. Um, we always, you know, we would never let someone um, turn this into a taxable vehicle because obviously it's a terrible idea. So those are, those are a few of them. Um, and then, you know, you want to look for people who really, I guess, understand the infinite banking concept. And to me, um, it's also important that that person's doing that and that they are doing it with their own, their own money. Um, and not just that it's a theory for them, uh, and that someone's actually a practitioner, which is a big, uh, a big piece of the puzzle. You don't want someone just setting something up that they don't know much about. So, Sure. So just to remind everybody, head over to uh, Drew's website, ibcdrew.com. And uh, Drew is also very active on LinkedIn. So it's a great way to connect. And it's IBC Drew. 
So before we start wrapping a few things up here, Drew, um, you know, early on, you mentioned uh, talking about uh, having a mentor when it came to your, yeah. when it came to your thing. And I want to end the show with a couple of things because uh, you had had a, a couple moments, obviously, you know, being trained as a nurse, getting back and right. getting into real estate investing. These are like earth shaking mindset shifts. Yeah, that uh, that have occurred in your life, and and talk to me a little bit about the importance of finding that mentor, and and how what what other activities have you done to get your mindset in the proper conditioning? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So um, early on, you know, I don't think I understood the value maybe of a coach and of finding someone um, that can help you. And so I had this mindset of go it alone. I'll figure this out myself, you know, and that's kind of how I did the debt part, getting out of debt. It was really me just doing stuff on my own. But um, I really, so one of, you know, I, I, I did, I, we didn't even get into this, but I did some uh, day trading as well in my career. And I hired a coach uh, during that. And um, I was very scarcely mindset and nervous about it. And he really um, challenged my mindset on a lot of things, um, got me into, you know, meditating, got me into affirmations and really pointed out some of the, um, you know, um, limiting beliefs that I had uh, regarding money in particular. And, uh, and so I started doing, you know, exercises he would give me. I remember he had one where it was like, write for five minutes without thinking about money, just write about money. And it's like all these things came up, you know, like money is the root of all evil and things that you hear. And, uh, mm-hmm. and it made me realize, man, I got some work. And so he was the first one that made me realize, gosh, a coach can take you far and push you, you know, and, and I, I was an athlete growing up and, and, you know, play a little soccer in college. And so I always loved coaching. And so, you know, that kind of helped me realize if I want to get into real estate, like I read a bunch of books and I still wasn't sure where do I start? What do I do? You know? And so I found someone that um, there's a book by Dan Sullivan called who, not how. And so I found a who that really I felt, you know, a connection with that I was like, okay, I think this is the guy that can help me. And that was at the time, John Fedro with um, mobile homes. And uh, I, I never, I was flipping a mobile home within a month because I had a coach. If I had gone it alone, I mean, I would have had re- excuse after excuse, you know, oh, I can't do this. Oh, you know, well, can't find a deal, you know? And, um, mm-hmm. and so coaches, I really am a, a big fan and, you know, I've even had life coaches I, and even with this infinite banking stuff, that's really what we um, call ourselves as like coaches or consultants. Um, because, you know, you need a teammate in this to help guide you that's doing it. Um, and so that, so for me, coaches have really stretched my mindset and helped me to grow. And then, um, really that set me down a path of reading more. I never really read much growing up. You know, I was, I was, I liked reading about sports, ESPN, um, and now, I mean, I, I feel like I consume books pretty quickly these days, and sometimes I read the same one over and over too. So, yeah, as, as I've gone, gotten older, I've I've found that if if something resonates with me, you know, I I used to just if I read it once, it was I used to use usually just gave it away or it went to, yeah. to goodwill. Um, but now, if it if it resonates, I I'll probably reread it uh, a couple times. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. And then there's some books now that I will almost read on an annual basis. Really? What, what would be that, those books? Uh, well, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm sure I've heard, I've, I've read that book more, more than once. Um, yeah. The uh, Richest Man in Babylon is, is mm-hmm. also a great one. The, um, the Traveler's Gift is a fantastic I book. I that one. I've never read that one. And uh and then I always read Never Split the Difference. That that one is oh, yeah. That one's an awesome book too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Voss. Yeah. yeah. So well, before I let you go, is there a question I you wished I would have asked you here today? I think that you covered it well. I appreciate you having me on the show and um really enjoyed it. Well, Drew, I really appreciate your time again. Everybody head over to ibcdrew.com and learn more about infinite banking and and see if Drew and his team can help you out. So thanks again, Drew. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been the REI Mastermind Network. You can already tell that we've made some changes and a few more are on the way. 
If you are interested in what we have planned, head over to patreon.com slash REI Mastermind and support the show today. Financial contributions are always appreciated, along with a like, share, and review. It really helps us grow and reach more people with this valuable information. See you next time, and tell a friend.